Good. Well, I'm very happy to uh, welcome everyone this evening. I hope you can hear on this rather dodgy microphone. Can you hear those furthest away? Good. Um, I'm Stephen Games. I'm very happy to welcome everyone here, and especially to, um, to have Alan Powers giving a talk tonight. I've been saying at Docomomo meetings over since last autumn that whatever else we arrange in 2019, we really have to have something that acknowledges that this is the centenary of the Bauhaus. It is also the semi-centenary, if there is such a thing, of the death of Gropius and Mies van der Rohe within six weeks of each other in the summer of 1969. Docomomo, of course, has its roots very much in the Bauhaus. Um, you know, our name stands for doc documenting, uh, documentation and conserving of building sites and neighbourhoods of the modern movement. And it is generally agreed in architectural and design circles that the modern movement originates largely from the Bauhaus and the educational and design principles developed there by its founder, Walter Gropius. Given that that is the sort of received wisdom about the Bauhaus, it does indeed need challenging. It has run for a very long time without massive challenge, really, certainly within our design circles. And when it comes to challenging this orthodoxy, I think Alan is very much the man uh, to do it. Um, in the remote, given the remote possibility that there's someone in this room who hasn't heard of Alan Powers so far, let me say that he is a prolific writer on architecture and uh, 20th century architecture and design. He's written monographs on Serge Chimaev and uh, Aldington Craig. Uh, he's organized exhibitions at Kettle's Yard and the Imperial War Museum. Uh, he has explored the work of Eric Ruvilius, uh, Enid Marx, and Edward Arizoni. Specifically, for our purposes, he is involved with the 20th Century Society and chaired it from 2007 to 2012. Now, that is very interesting for us because there is clear blue water between the 20th Century Society and Docomomo. We are a uh, much more hardline 20th century organization, if you like. They are more open and inclusive. And in their conservation work, they welcome neo-Georgian and postmodern architecture. Here at Docomomo, when we get calls from local activists to help us <coughs> to save their local 1930s Odeon, we sort of grit our teeth with embarrassment and wonder what to do and then say, tell them to get in touch with the 20th century society. So I'm particularly interested in what Alan will be uh, saying this evening and the, what he will bring to the perspective of the, the Bauhaus, not least in the light of the title of his new book. There it is up on the screen. Bauhaus Goes West. Uh, the literal, literal meaning of it is, is, is clear. Uh, it refers to the leaders of the Bauhaus, Gropius and others, who went west from Central Europe to the United Kingdom, in Gropius's case and then on to the United States. But you realize also that locked up in that cryptic title, the idea of going west means plowing, crashing, failing, perishing, being destroyed, falling off a cliff. And I'm intrigued also by the title, Bauhaus Goes West, rather than The Bauhaus Goes West. It is a very cryptic title. We're going to ask Alan what it all means. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, if I address the title first, um, I, was, I had to find something that was fairly snappy that included Britain and America. Uh, and, um, you know, if you put too many words in the title, people uh, lose attention. Uh, and uh, I didn't really think about leaving out a definite article, um, but it sounded better without. And maybe this could be said to reflect uh, the fact that there is one thing called the Bauhaus, um, which existed historically, and then there is a, a, a more undefined concept called Bauhaus. Uh, 
which I think is the case, uh, which is really what I'm partly talking about this evening. Um, the book does indeed, as, as Stephen said, talk a lot about Britain, and my intention there uh, was in fact rather shamelessly to harness this uh, very sales um, effective brand uh, to a discussion of a number of people in Britain in the interwar period and after who would uh, receive no attention whatever unless they were given this glamorous sheen, as it were. So I was able to smuggle in a lot of rather dim people, and some people would imagine them to be. I, but uh, this is actually quite intentional because uh, you know, our sense of what is dim and what is the opposite of dim have been shaped around things such as the Bauhaus, which have dictated a scale of values, which uh, what I'm going to do this evening is to, in some ways, um, question that scale of values. And once you start to do that, quite a lot of other things sort of move and shift on their position in the map, uh, which, as a historian, I feel that's the only thing worth doing. If you leave the landscape as you found it, you have not done your job. Uh, so, um, indeed, I, in my uh, introduction, I do deal with this secondary meaning of go, go west, which I don't think is really kind of colloquial uh, language, particularly among younger people anymore, the sort of wartime thing, wasn't it? Um, but this, this rather kind of pleased me, the sense that it could have that meaning. And, and indeed, the story I tell, it's not that I had to sort of prove it, but uh, that is uh, rolled into it as well in, I think, quite significant ways, uh, which I'm not dealing with here, but buy the book and read it if, if you want. <laughs> um, so the idea of, of going west, in a sense, if we go uh, first to the USA, um, we can find the, the Bauhaus opposition in a form that never existed in Britain. Um, uh, in House Beautiful magazine, under the editor Elizabeth Gordon, um, uh, this is, is a bit of a joke, but uh, she was a very interesting figure who uh, wanted uh, her readers, middle class uh, Americans, to uh, take on a certain kind of modernism, but uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was really her pole star, and uh, she decided that the Bauhaus was the wrong kind, and that it was indeed a sort of deception practiced on the American people, particularly in 1953, she did this, I think it's July issue of House Beautiful magazine uh, called um, uh, The Next American Home. And, uh, and in it, she has this sidebar, which I've reproduced in the book, which says, this is your tick list of good modern and bad modern. And Bauhaus represents bad modern because it's, um, it's not adaptable, it's, not, it's too extreme, it's too aesthetic, uh, it doesn't work very well. Um, she was also very involved in publicizing the quarrel between Edith Farnsworth and Miss van der Rohe over the Farnsworth House, and taking that as, a, as an example of how an architect has spent a great deal of the client's money and produced something that the client actually didn't want uh, and can't use. Uh, so the, there is a book on Elizabeth Gordon by uh, Monica Pennick, published by Yale in 2017, uh, which goes further into her, her sort of career, a very pioneering uh, woman magazine editor in her generation, uh, and somebody who uh, would certainly have claimed that she stood for modern, but, uh, but for a particular kind, which was a lot of the time at some removed from where some of the architects were. Once I read her pieces, I realized Tom Wolfe didn't really invent anything new at all. He simply borrowed it from Elizabeth Gordon, who would have been writing when he was a young man, or more or less. Uh, he adds his own very amusing glosses on this, um, I think, very distorted and prejudicial view of uh, what the Bauhaus might have been in American terms. It's, it's very funny. If you haven't read it, you must. But uh, it has a very tenuous relationship with reality, I think. Uh, but um, already before this, I think, uh, this this amazing um, brand name uh, had um, become a point of division. And Mies van der Rohe said the best thing Gropius ever did was to invent that name. Um, it, 
if you imagine that if he hadn't, he might have become the director of the Kunstgewerbeschule Weimar, or rather the Staatliches Kunstgewerbeschule und Kunstakademie Weimar, uh, to give it its full title. Uh, and you know, that would not be tripping off our tongues. Um, so, so that was brilliant. Uh, I think it's virtually meaningless in terms of uh, what they actually did there. Uh, but the idea of needling the Bauhaus, or indeed um, uh, knocking it, um, goes back quite a long way. Walter Dexel admittedly wrote this, um, this essay, Bauhaus Style of Myth, in the 1960s, but he uh, had um, lived through that period, and we seem to have lost a, a line of the text. I don't know how that happened. Um, so he says, you know, we call it Bauhaus style, uh, but actually, you know, that's a, a misnomer. Uh, it was already there. It didn't um, require the Bauhaus to create it. Uh, and then there is a quote. I, I lifted that Walter Dexel quote from the introduction to the MoMA 2010 Bauhaus exhibition book, Workshop for Modernity. And uh, Leah Dickerman, who um, was one of the catalog editors for <coughs> Barry Birdle, um, uh, there uh, sort of describes how, how this word has, has grown beyond uh, its uh, shape. This is why I call it the Bauhaus balloon tonight, because it's like you're inflating something. There is something there. Uh, but it has become so inflated that you can't see anything else. It's filled the room, uh, if you like. And uh, the process by which this happened has been described by a number of writers, but it's actually so diverse, it's happening in so many places at once, it's quite hard to, um, uh, to encapsulate it. Uh, but it is, I think, fascinating. Uh, many people feel it began in 1938, with the uh, Bauhaus exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art uh, that was quite a, quite a curious creation in a way. Um, Walter Gropius had arrived in America uh, the year before. Uh, Alfred Barr was very keen to have a Bauhaus exhibition, but it was um, uh, partly John McAndrew, who was uh, the architecture curator at the time, plus Herbert Bayer, who was the uh, ex-Bauhaus designer for the exhibition, who who created it. It was done in a great hurry against great difficulty, as you can imagine, because all this stuff was basically in Germany. A lot of the people were in Germany. It was politically extremely dangerous to uh, let it be known even that you had been part of this school. Um, and several of the contributors had their names anonymized in the catalog because they didn't want the consequences if they were still in Germany. Those who had left Germany were in some cases very hard to trace. And there's these very poignant correspondence files at MoMA where um, Bayer, McAndrew, and others are writing letters saying, when did you last hear of so-and-so? Do you know where they are? And, and you know, addresses six months ago, they were in this position, but they may not be there now. All this kind of thing is, is, uh, is recorded there. Uh, so they put on this exhibition, which was um, sort of in two ways incomplete. Uh, first of all, Gropius decided that it would only go up to 1928, the year that he retired as director. He um, uh, chose uh, to leave out Hannes Meyer, his immediate successor, who uh, ran the school for two years, um, who I shall mention shortly, and Miss van der Rohe, who took over for the succeeding two years. So four years out of 14 is, is quite a big chunk to, to leave out. Um, and uh, then also, of course, in terms of the exhibits, they, they just couldn't get all that much stuff. It was um, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit difficult. Uh, I will risk running over time and tell you a, a rather touching story, though, that Barry Bergdahl told me, um, that uh, at the end of the exhibition, he, he was sort of preparing to to leave his position as architecture curator at, at MoMA and go back to work, teach at uh, Columbia University. And it was nagging at him that 
there was a major drawing by the Hungarian architect Farkas Molnár, uh, which should be in the collection because it had been in the 38 exhibition, it had gone on tour, it had never been deaccessioned or returned to the lender. Um, but where was it? They never found it. And he told me he went out to that big store in Queens and uh, was working through a plan chest, drawer after drawer, nothing, nothing, nothing. Got to the bottom drawer, at the bottom of the bottom drawer, there was the Farkas Molnár drawing. So, you know, nobody knew it was there. And uh, then they managed to find the um, sort of titular owner, who was an old lady, a relative, living in Hungary, Budapest. Uh, Julia Kinchen, uh, Barry's um, colleague, uh, knows Hungarian, so she phoned up this lady in her nursing home. Uh, they made a very good offer for buying it, which she accepted. So now it has been accessioned, finally. Uh, to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, but it's fascinating, it's that near to us in time, all, all these activities, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, but uh, there was a bigger sense that uh, Gropius and Siegfried Gideon, who came to teach at Harvard in his time, uh, delivering the lectures that became Space, Time and Architecture, had sort of artificially inflated the Bauhaus already. Uh, you probably know that book and how he uh, has this big thing about how you know the corner, the glazed corner of the uh, Dessau Bauhaus School building is analogous to a Cubist Picasso painting, and this is the final realization of where modernity becomes form uh, in shifting planes and perspectives, and the, the loss of uh, a kind of a single point perspective uh, and, and it becoming something else. Um, so uh, for, for Gideon, Gropius was, uh, was the tops, really. He was very keen on Corbusier as well, as it happened. Uh, but this is from a German architect, uh, Ferdinand Kramer, uh, who was part of Ernst Mai's um, team in Frankfurt. And uh, this comes from a recent catalogue of an exhibition at the DAM on uh, Frankfurt housing. And uh, you can see what it says there. Uh, Ernst Mai doesn't get a look in, the man who created all this effective workers' housing with uh, appropriate manufactured uh, furnishings and, um, and goods for the people. Uh, the things the Bauhaus claim to do, and you know, to, to recognize their problems, they, they had no position from which to do this. Uh, they were a struggling art school. They did get involved in producing the Turton estate in, uh, in Dessau, uh, you know, which was much photographed and reproduced. But it's, it's a puny thing compared to Frankfurt. Uh, Frankfurt is the goods, uh, and there it all still is, still functioning uh, beautifully. And, and yet, you know, Bauhaus is the thing. Um, so from within Germany, the, uh, the Bauhaus debate, the Bauhaus critique, uh, is picked up after the war um, here by uh, Rudolf Schwarz, uh, the church architect. You know, all these people knew each other when they were young, uh, but he chose in 1953 to do this all-out attack on the Bauhaus. Uh, this is from Wolfgang Petz's um, uh, account of it. Uh, and the sense that, you know, this thing is, has become a bit of a monster. Or, or a zombie, as I've described it in my book. Uh, it's no longer the real thing. It's become a, a caricature version of it that's rampaging around and convincing people it is the real thing. Uh, so um, there is this uh, political issue involved in, at that point, criticizing the Bauhaus, which um, I'll come to shortly, but this is how uh, it goes on, Schwarz feels he's, he's won. Um, he talks about uh, the interment of a notorious corpse, uh, a worldview that had died of old age. Incidentally, this is interestingly what John Summerson said about David Watkins' book, Morality and Architecture. He said this, this is a memorial to ideas that died years ago. Um, but he never said it in public. <laughs> Uh, always hedging his bets. Um, and uh, perhaps he's being a little triumphalist uh, here. 
because, as Paint goes on to explain, the Bauhaus has this big comeback then in the 1950s and 60s, um, which I don't know of an account that really puts all the pieces of this together. But one of the things we know is that it was very strongly supported by the USA as part of its Cold War project. Uh, the Bauhaus was seen to represent, first of all, denazification, quite obvious. You know, the Nazis shut the Bauhaus and they didn't like it, so it must be good because the Nazis were bad. Um, uh, and also in the DDR, you know, that, that's, uh, uh, a, it was conveniently in the sort of Stalinist period when they were not being modernist, later that changed, but uh, still it was, it was adopted, it was funded with um, uh, US money and uh, um, Frank Whitford told me, it's a fascinating thing which I'd love to verify from documents, that uh, this exhibition took place in Stuttgart and uh, there was a desire to bring it to London, but there was no money for it. Uh, so the German, the West German cultural attaché in London uh, got in touch with you know, whoever there was in the uh, Bundestag or whatever to say, uh, if you don't pay for this exhibition to come to London, there's one from the DDR that will come instead, <laughs> which was a complete lie. <laughs> She made it up, she fabricated it, but it was enough to produce the money that brought that exhibition to the Royal Academy in 1968. Who, who saw that at the Academy that year? Not very many. I, I just about could have done, but I, uh, I'm afraid I missed it. Um, and uh, Hans Bingler is a fascinating character. Uh, you know, he lived through the war, but his parents were quite anti-Nazi. They managed to lie low. So he was, he was clean, as, if you like immediately at the end of the war. He had no taint of having been in the Hitler Youth or any of those things. Uh, so he was a perfect person to do this job. He and Gropius worked very hand in glove on, you know, I, I wouldn't wish to knock this project at all. They, they did what they absolutely should have done, which was to get all the documents together and archive them. Uh, so it is a major resource, but that in itself has, if you like, it's fueled the zombie. Um, you know, this is so much better archived than anything else particularly when they have the archive open, which for the last three years they haven't, uh, uh, weirdly. Um, and uh, so then, um, you know, it, it has its building which is being uh, renewed and expanded in Berlin. Meanwhile, um, there is a new mm. Bauhaus Museum in Weimar, which is one of the most horrible museums I've been in for a very long time. <laughs> Anybody seen it? Yeah. Uh, it's just so totally unsuitable. Weirdly, it stands rather close to, but not in a, a relationship with, a lot of Nazi <coughs> buildings in Weimar. Uh, there's this big sort of garden, uh, what's it called, a, 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 a Gauerzentrum or Gauerplatz or something, which they tried to create. It looks like a county hall by Vincent Harris, but actually rather better designed. Um, uh, and, and this is this is obviously the bit of land they had available for this is, um, uh, is tucked in behind, but it's, it's looking a lot more Vincent Harris than it is Bauhaus, I think. Uh, and inside it is, as you can see, this is, it's a more or less windowless box, um, and the scale is enormous, the floor to ceiling heights are massive, uh, which doesn't suit the objects, which are mostly rather small, uh, and, and generally everybody I've talked to who's seen it uh, feels that it's you know, the whole tone of it is completely wrong. I think only last week they opened the new museum in Dessau, uh, and I have yet to see that or uh, judge it. Um, but the, um, uh, the current Bundestag put 70 million euros into the Bauhaus centenary celebrations. According to Wolfgang Voigt from the Deutsche Architektur Museum, uh, because it was seen as a pushback against the far right. Um, so the same sort of political narrative is renewing itself. I'm all in favour of pushing back against the far right, but whether spending all that money on the Bauhaus is the most effective way of doing it, I'm not sure. Uh, but nobody sort of questioned that. This was an appropriate political gesture. Um, and I presume, presumably some of that money funded the museum there. But one of the interesting things is that the critique of the Bauhaus um, comes 
to a great extent from within. Um, <coughs> people who are involved in the various cultural organizations that have sort of sprung from its heritage, uh, such as Philip Ostwald, who was part of the, um, the Dessau-based, um, whatever it's called, the Bauhaus Universität or Stiftung or whatever. And this book, Bauhaus Conflicts, um, I think is a very interesting collection of essays, pre-war and predominantly post-war, in fact, um, sort of looking rather more closely at uh, how this idea was received and developed and um, responded to change, particularly in the Hochschule von Gestaltung at Ulm, um, which I do mention in my book, uh, several people have said either, either I should have left it out or I should have said more about it. Sometimes you can't win. Um, but uh, uh, here Philipp Ostwald is saying, you know, the Bauhaus can never be described as, as a unitary thing. Uh, it changes so much in the course of its life uh, that no generalizations are really appropriate for it. Uh, and uh, something very similar comes in this exhibition catalogue from this year uh, from the Brohan uh, Museum in Berlin. Um, with, I love this, uh, one might thus formulate the paradoxical statement that the Bauhaus could only turn into the Bauhaus by turn its, turning its back on the Bauhaus concept. This is really a comment on uh, what happened when I took over. He, um, I got this quote from him here uh, in his letter to <coughs> Fritz Hesse, the mayor of Dessau, who supported the whole thing. He said he arrived and thought it was just rubbish uh, what he'd inherited. He had been teaching that, uh, admittedly, for a year or two, and actually starting the architecture classes that Gropius never got around to doing. Um, but uh, he said it had become this sort of precious cult, um, very 1890s in a way, you know, everybody obsessed by certain formal uh, things. Um, uh, sorry, apologies for the typing errors. Um, uh, life strangled by art, I think, is, is the key phrase. Uh, quite the opposite of what it was supposed to do and what we all think happened. Um, and I don't think he was over-egging it. Hannes Meyer is, uh, in so many ways, I think, the, the missing key to understanding the Bauhaus um, and there is still really relatively little literature about him. You know, if we want to recapture the Bauhaus, we should go for those two Hannes Meyer years. That was the really, that was the good bit, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so uh, this question of um, industrial design, which is so often uh, upheld as being, you know, the great USP of the Bauhaus, they uh, got artists and uh, somehow design, industrial design came out at the other end. Um, yes, there's something in that. Uh, it was you know, very much what was going on in British art schools at the same time. It was certainly not unique to Germany in any uh, way, and very likely it was going on elsewhere too. And one of the weird things is how little we know about what went on in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, uh, France uh, in, re with regard to this. Almost all our information seems to be about the Bauhaus and most of it's wrong. Um, so uh, Robin Schuldenfrey, uh, now at Portal Institute, uh, has done this amazing essay that also uh, appears in her recent uh, book, um, uh, Luxury Modern, uh, about how you know, they set out to do objects for the people. And as I said in something I wrote not that long ago, uh, it's not so much habitat as aspray, um, what they come up with. Uh, these are very high-priced luxury goods, and they know it. Uh, you know, it's not just a one-off mistake. It it's seems to be a deliberate policy on this. Um, Robert doesn't explain why they should have done this. At one point, she exasperatedly says, no, they could at least have designed a fork. Uh, <laughs> and one does wonder what was going on. Um, you know. Uh, if Gropius was in charge of this, what was he thinking? Uh, so, um, and, and in this catalogue, they're saying, you know, most exacting, the Nashta, uh, finest craftsmanship, finest hand of it. Um, you know, this is not what we're told. This is meant to be machine production for the masses, but it isn't. Uh, they didn't even know how 
machines made things, so they couldn't design that way. Uh, they made things that looked machine-y, but could, could only be made by hand. Uh, so all this kind of problematic is there, uh, but not recognized, certainly not recognized in the English-speaking world for a very long time. Um, in the literature in England, a few people raise questions and doubts. There's an interesting review by John Summerson of Gropius's New Architecture of the Bauhaus in the Architect and Building News. And he says, well, this is all very fine, but uh, how many of the industrial experts actually knew about teaching? Um, you know, were they able to teach? Uh, the answer is they didn't really have any industrial experts. Um, the teachers were good at, at doing something else, usually. So, you know, it was a lot more chaotic than Gropius was prepared to admit. He was very good at putting a gloss on it and selling the idea. Uh, for years afterwards, indeed. Um, uh, and I do recommend this book, which I hadn't discovered before I started on my research. Paul Betts is, is now at the University of Oxford. He's a, a historian of modern Germany, basically. But, but this is, is very much about objects, both before and after, during and after the war. Uh, and um, uh, he's very interested in, he is American, in this um, uh, sort of thing about the Cold War and how that adopted the Bauhaus as a sort of mascot, um, which uh, is, uh, I think, very interesting, uh, and how Nazism is sort of played off against it in the manner that I described. Uh, and this is taking up the same three theme from Kathleen James Tracaborty, who uh, is currently teaching in Dublin, and has written, I think, really the best books on 20th century German architecture, which not only describe, but they, they kind of challenge the concepts and um, review them uh, in, a, in a very energetic kind of way. Uh, so uh, she is referencing Paul Betts, uh, and particularly what he wrote about, and what uh, Winfried um, Nerdinger has written about, that the idea that the Nazis completely rejected the Bauhaus, yes, that's what they said they did, but in reality, not at all, or very little. Uh, and this cuts two ways. First of all, they um, carried on manufacturing and promoting many of the goods that had been designed by Bauhaus people, who may indeed have um, greatly resented it. Greta Marx, who came to England, her, she had to sell her factory to the local Gauleiter. Um, and they, her work had been condemned as being um, degenerate and Jewish. Uh, and uh, this uh, Nazi who bought the factory just went on producing the same things. <laughs> uh, so I don't know what we make of that. Um, and Neufert, uh, well known, a well-known name to any architects among you, and there is a page from a fairly early edition of his Bar Entwurf's Lehrer, and the, I, I got a wartime edition of this, which um, I don't know how it differs from the very first. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. It really should be reprinted from one of those early editions. It's sort of, you know, how much room you need to get a horse into a railway carriage. Uh, and uh, it's so German. Uh, how two people can occupy the same bedroom according to what their relationship is. You know, a married couple in one bed, married couple in two beds, uh, uh, two sisters, um, and, and all sorts of other permutations with all the beds sort of turned around different ways. And here I was rather fascinated to see uh, two people in one bath, um, <laughs> bathtub. Um, and uh, I think it was, he was having fun with a lot of this. Uh, but as Neufert had gone to America in 1936 um, to look for work, he got a call saying, we've sold up first edition, we want some revisions, will you come back? So back he came and uh, did sterling service for the Nazis. Uh, and so did a good many other uh, Bauhaus connected architects. So Neufert, I don't think he'd been a student, but he'd worked in Gropius's office uh, when it was based in Weimar, and he stayed on in Weimar and taught at the Bauhausschule, which um, Otto Bartning um, ran in the same building after the Bauhaus had gone after Dessau, uh, about which more later. Um, so we do by now know about Gropius and Mies getting a little bit. Um, kind of uh, the wrong side of the line, um, but 
being rescued, in fact, by circumstances beyond their control when their designs were rejected. They didn't have this kind of ignominy of having actually worked for the Nazis, but they were all up for it, uh, so far as we can see. Um, uh, there were others who either, you know, they couldn't um, resist, they had a job to do, uh, and so on. So um, uh, that's another bit of the myth that is knocked away, that you know, all, all these Bauhaus people were you know, uh, sufficiently left-wing, but not too left-wing, um, to resist this uh, temptation. Um, I'm quoting here from, from this more recent book by uh, <coughs> Cathy Chakraborty. Um, this is from her introduction, and I find this rather excited when I read this, I must say, because she makes this list of um, five things that are commonly believed to be true about modern architecture. Uh, and her point is that none of these are true. <clears throat> and I think if we accept what she's saying here, our whole view of the subject has to change. Uh, we don't have to reject the things that we like, but we must simply drop some of these myths uh, that have become attached to them and have been used over so many years and decades to promote them. Uh, and um, I don't know about yourselves, you are here at a Docomomo meeting, and this is she is uh, destroying your articles of belief here. Uh, you may leave the room at this point if you wish. Um, and I'd be interested here afterwards what you think, uh, because I'm coming near the end. One of the um, parts of the argument that I wasn't able to make in my book, uh, partly because it's not really, wasn't my theme, and I don't think I shall ever be able to undertake this work, but I really think <coughs> somebody else does it, is uh, we know quite a lot about the Bauhaus, we perhaps even know too much about it. But we know, we, even in Germany, I think, hardly anybody knows anything about what went on in the other art and design schools at that time. Uh, I've got um, two examples here. This book, I was lucky enough to be commissioned to go out and review this exhibition in Leipzig in 1997, but it was fascinating talking to Uta Kamphausen and her colleagues about how they did it. This is about the quite long-running Kunstgewerbe Schule in, in Leipzig. You know, had Gropius not turned up in Weimar, they might have had a very similar organization there. It's uh, basically a sort of school of applied arts uh, where they do the crafts, um, but with, a, with an attitude that's kind of approach to things being able to be produced and sold. Uh, so, um, first of all, they, they had a huge struggle in '97 to actually assemble the material. You know, first of all, it had been dispersed by the Nazis, then the Nazis had come in, all that material had been dispersed, and then it was the DDR, uh, and there were no records kept, and they had to go and find people and ask what they had. And they did a fantastic job getting the stuff together. Uh, and it's a particularly good, well illustrated catalogue as well. And there is one example, which I picked because it's sort of a little more Bauhaus looking, perhaps, than all of the things. But um, I think we have very readily accepted the idea that the Bauhaus, as it were, sets the standard. And uh, I've described elsewhere how this becomes a double bind. You meet the Bauhaus standard, but if you don't get there in time, uh, you are merely being an imitator and you don't count. Uh, you don't meet the Bauhaus standard, you do something different, and you don't count either. So there's no way you can win, unless you are the so-called Bauhaus. So I think this is a false standard of judgment and, and should be let go of in order that we can look at some other things and appreciate what they're trying to do. I think much the same would be said of the, um, uh, the work of the Staatlicher Staatlicher Hauch, Bauhausschule. Um, that's under a Bauhaus, as it's called, in this Bauhaus archive production, because nobody will buy it unless you call it that. <laughs> <laughs> but there could have been a lot of Andere Bauhausen, uh, or Andere Bauhäusen, Häuser. Um, uh, this isn't the only one. It does happen to be in the same building. 
Otto Bartning was an architect, a modernist, but not uh, a Bauhaus modernist, you could say. Um, and uh, that's the plan of a, of a building by Hans <coughs> Neufeld in Jena, a university building, the, the uh, Abbe Arnum, uh, which is a nice building. So they're doing you know, very comparable stuff. It may not be quite so pure, but maybe it sells better. <coughs> uh, who knows? We really don't know. We know so little. And the book, um, which I have to confess I haven't read through because my German's not that great. Uh, and here, you know, just as an example, Eric Diekmann uh, taught that he had this career that included the Bauhaus, but also included all these other places. And one of the schools that I think it well um, deserves uh, further exploration is the Kunstgewerbe Schule Gebischenstein at Halle, where Georg Mücher, who'd been one of the original Bauhaus staff, went off to become the head and was still there after the war. Um, so uh, the Bauhaus is not sort of unitary in this sense, and these people are moving around. Uh, including after 1933, and many of them are still there uh, after the Second World War. And indeed, um, in my research for my book on Enid Marx, uh, she was part of a British delegation going out to Germany in 1946 for the Board of Trade to find out what was happening both in uh, industry and in design mm -hmm. education. And they, they met Georg Mücher, and as with almost every German art school, they said they got back on their feet in an amazingly short time and they're doing really good work. And, you know, we should get them over to look at us and give us some advice on how to do it. Um, so that itself is a fascinating story. But I think looking at these chairs, which I just found this picture on the internet, and of course they were de described as Bauhaus chairs, um, because everything always is. Uh, and uh, yes, I mean, we can tell they didn't come out of Dessau. Uh, but are they, for that reason, of no interest? Uh, I don't think so. An interesting little tidbit I picked up uh, when going through uh, the online Marcel Breuer archive from the University of Syracuse, and that's very well presented online. Uh, and quite hard, I, I, I suppose I know how this got into the papers or can guess, but uh, it's a letter from uh, Nicholas Pefsner to Jack Pritchard uh, Jack Pritchard of Isacon, who was producing Breuer's furniture. And Pritchard had obviously written uh, to Pevsner, who was at that time uh, the shop manager for the Gordon Russell shop in Wigmore Street in London, um, uh, to, to say, you know, why aren't you selling more Breuer chairs? And Pevsner writes back, um, uh, we're not selling more of them because we have these chairs by uh, Bruno Matson from Sweden, and they're more comfortable than people prefer them. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think most of us know that many of the objects that are design classics that are in all the museums and in all the books are probably the failures. They're not the ones that people actually had at home. Um, and, uh, and yet, somehow, not much adjustment is made for that perception. Um, just one more slide to advertise something I've been invited to do with uh, the RIVA and the Society of Architectural Historians of Great Britain. It's a new venture uh, as a collaboration. It's a series of six sessions on um, uh, Tuesday evenings from the 29th of October. Uh, Neil Chassor came up with the title Burning Down the House. Um, uh, it's a very gentle uh, application of flame, I think, in this case, fireworks rather than bonfire. Um, but if you're interested, uh, it does cost more than coming to one of these sessions, but you get um, uh, an intimate group and contact with a number of experts who we've invited to come along, and we'll have objects from the RIVA collections uh, in the room for people to look at. So uh, if this interests you, it's only just gone up. Um, uh, so that's the, um, the web address if you're interested in signing up for it. Thank you. No. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Um, this is, this is interesting. I said it would be a challenge um, because in some ways it undermines 
I suppose what could be regarded as the, the Bauhaus religion, I mean, it is a religion, isn't it? And one, one has devout apostles and, uh, and disciples uh, who sign up to a pledge, the, the Bauhaus doctrine, as it were. And um, Alan, in his very reasonable way, uh, takes that, takes that to, to, to bits. There are issues that you raise about, I mean, issues to do with failure of the Bauhaus, uh, the question of whether it lived up to its reputation. And one immediate question is your challenge, the same sort of, well, the challenge that might be made of William Morris, that uh, he was a man who talked about producing <coughs> for, the, for the people and not for the, for the wealthy, uh, the idea that Bauhaus production should be machine production, but in fact what the artifacts that were actually made were terribly expensive. But surely, I put to you, uh, surely the products that were made in the time of the Bauhaus were necessarily expensive because they were prototypes. They were ideas for what industrially produced objects could be at a time when the machinery for industrial production did not yet exist. Had the factories been in operation, then presumably these were products that would have been available on a much larger scale at a much lower price. Shall I answer that as best I can? I don't have all the chapter and verse for that. But, uh, you know, Frankfurt produced this sort of manual for householders of all the things you can buy for your um, Frankfurt house. And I haven't looked at the prices, but I think they, they couldn't have got away with offering stuff that was beyond the income level of the kind of people who were in those houses, which was sort of upper working class, I, I assume. Um, so that's one particular exception. There were many more of these books, I've got one at home, with sort of catalogue pictures of, of modern things. Um, of which some may be Bauhaus products. You know, they took their place among those. The, the things that Robin Children Fry picks out are the, as it were, the, um, you know, the, the things that prove her point. There were other products that um, were more effective in terms of sales. The textiles, which weirdly were left out of the catalogue entirely, uh, and the wallpapers, which was the biggest success of all. Now, we don't hear a lot about Bauhaus wallpapers. It's become a sort of trope that you know, if anybody raises this, you say, wallpapers. Um, and, uh, and yet, you know, I think that's, that's not been really worked into the story the way it needs to be. Questions from the, from the audience? Anyone? Okay. Yes? Yes? Um, does your book investigate um, links between the Bauhaus and... Um, post-revolutionary constructivism in Russia, and also with the steel in um, Holland? Uh, no, it doesn't really, because it's not a book about the Bauhaus as such. It's, it's more about the sort of waves that come from it. Um, yes, uh, that's a very interesting question, and the whole question of Van Doesberg pitching up in Weimar and making a nuisance of himself is, uh, as I, I think, not been sort of fully uh, described. I mean, uh, I think it's not surprising that Gropius sort of first of all told him to go get lost and then stole his ideas. <laughs> you would, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, I don't think uh, Van Doesberg had a very strong understanding of human interaction, put it that way. Didn't know how to uh, make his point gently and uh, infiltrate the system. It was entirely confrontational uh, from the beginning. Um, uh, Russian, um, I think it's harder to trace that actually, uh, because, you know, first of all, one could quite plausibly say there is no such thing as Bauhaus architecture. Um, and I think others might agree. Uh, everything they have is kind of borrowed from somewhere else. Uh, Gropius, yes, he's an architect, and uh, to begin with, he's virtually the only one who's there. Uh, and they have this extraordinary thing that for the Haus am Horn, for the 1923 exhibition, they're going to build one building. You know, they can only afford to do one, and they have a competition, and they choose a painter as the designer of this extremely amateur, incompetent little house, quite honestly. Uh, you know, it's a real amateur architect's plan with a main living room with only a tiny amount of window outlook. Uh, you've got a lovely landscape in front of you, and you, you can't see it. Um, anybody been there? Do you agree? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I mean, it works as an exhibition space, uh, but as a dwelling, 
you know, it's not a, a good prototype, I would say. Uh, so, you know, the level of incompetence with which they handle architecture, really until Hans Meyer gets there, is, is quite surprising. Yes, the Dessau Bauhaus building is rather a great building, although I don't think it was given any particular um, preeminence in the discourse uh, until Gideon sort of picked it out and said this is the thing. Uh, in Bruno Taut's book Modern Architecture that was published by the studio in London in 1929, yes it's there, it's a slightly odd head-on photograph um, from the north side, uh, no from the west east side, uh, and it's just there one among many and there's Hugo Herring and you know the rest of the team are, are all there. So you know it became an icon in the same way that the Fargus factory it took a while for that to become an icon. They didn't even have the right photos of it to begin with. Um, uh, if that's the case, though, uh, Alan, where, where was their greater expertise? In, I mean, if, if one criticises the Bauhaus for not having the expertise that it claimed to have, where was their greater in expertise teaching. in the development of prefabrication, industrialised buildings, or the ideas that the Bauhaus was claiming for itself? Um, well, the prefabrication is a very interesting question. Gropius was obsessed by this, and, and every time he tried to do it, it was more or less a failure. Um, I mean, the, the Yoko blocks that he adopted using in the early 20s um, uh, were not his system. It was a kind of industrial producer's system of, of clinker blocks, basically, uh, with a, uh, what I think was a linoleum layer in between them for insulation. And the Auerbach house at Jena, for example, is built out of these and it's still standing. It was quite a good system. It was cheap uh, and combined with concrete floors uh, and a certain amount of timber as well. But, you know, they were going through hard times uh, at that time. The materials were very hard to get. Um, so uh, I think the industrialists were needing it. It's not come, certainly not coming from the Bauhaus. Uh, Gropius's office... You know, there's no effort there, and he's no doubt doing research on these things. Uh, but it's from the collective of architects. I think probably not only in Germany, but elsewhere as well. They're it's changing. Like the Lampier, they were producing very good um, architecture in the 30s, and they bought a factory, and a complex of workers' houses, which is, is really very interesting. Yes. I mean, I don't think we look enough at the technical side, uh, but I suspect there's nothing special about the Bauhaus in that regard. Well, surely the uh, prestige of the Bauhaus has a lot to do with the artists. I mean, Paul Clay, you know, one of the top six artists of the 20th century, there was no school of architecture associated with, or of school of art associated with anybody of comparable standing. Kandinsky, Schlemmer, Morinagi, so you're getting what is effectively a galaxy which no other school can rival, as a matter of fact. But I think an, another school in Germany, I don't know, you haven't mentioned it, and perhaps I'm, I'm wrong, but that the school in Breslau, which mm. was headed by Hans Pilzig, mm. um, was the place to go to if you weren't uh, in Germany at the time. Yes. And of course, I... Albert Big Frank, who designed most of Finsbury, is, uh, was a pupil of. Mm. Yes. So uh, we got an influx, not only yes. from the Bauhaus, but from there too. <laughs> yes. Uh, I know Peter Morrow went to uh, Charlottenburg, as a lot of people did, and uh, then he went on to Zurich before coming to England. And I know he said that um, all the teaching he had in Germany had taught him absolutely nothing, <laughs> or, or in Switzerland either. It was only when he got into Lubeckin's office he actually learned anything useful. Um, so I don't know what we make of that, but... Uh, uh, no, I'd love to know more about all these things. And there's no book on the Breslau School, is there? No, I don't think so. Because I say that the artists... The artists, the artists. But I think the question is that the, those artists, um, uh, you know, they, they, they were not an art school. Uh, yes, I think Clay fed a lot into the textiles, and he gave his lectures. But how much further one can actually trace his, his hand, or he's a nice person to have around... Uh, uh, Kandinsky, Ditto, I think they were, it was more in the kind of mentoring and pastoral area that they had their effect, so far as I can tell. They, they you know, said wise things to the students. Um, 
because it explains the predominance of the bad house because it's associated Yeah, with I don't know whether it doesn't work the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, and would we have ever heard of Schlemmer if, it, if he hadn't been at the Bauhaus? I, I was taught in my first year by someone who was at the Bauhaus. And their reason for going to the Bauhaus was because of Paul Clay being there. And the impression I got was that indeed a lot of people went because of these big names of well, artists who were already well known. Um, even if once you got there, they weren't giving you exactly what you wanted or expected. In his case, he said that Clay was a lovely person, a wonderful artist, but a hopeless teacher. And so he changed very quickly and he went to work with Schlemmer instead, um, who they found very much more um, exciting because he wasn't so well known outside. And it was much more startling, um, unexpected kind of stuff that was coming out of that. And that's what this group of young people who've been attracted by the avant-garde, who had therefore come to this place thinking that it was going to give them something new that they wouldn't get anywhere else. As soon as they got there, they were going to move to whoever was even more, if you like, extreme or exciting and doing something they'd never seen before outside. They'd seen play outside before. Fine, they got there. They then found Schlemmer was doing these extraordinary things which were actually dynamic. And so they, they would move over to that. And there were other sorts of um, comments about um, people who actually were better as jazz pianists and very popular <coughs> rather than as good teachers. This, this is typical art school, isn't it, really? Well, yes, but I think... <laughs> Where they used to be. Uh, I, I think the, the, my point would be that the sorts of people who get attracted to that sort of school make something of it. Um, you have to have certain people there to attract them. But once they get there, this, it's actually perhaps the group of students who are important to some people. I, I would absolutely agree as, about that. That seems to come out from a lot of the testimony. Uh, yes, I mean, one would love to pick this apart in a maybe slightly more sceptical spirit, but you know, try and, as a result of that, pick up you know, what is gold standard, as it were, about these people. Um, and. Enid Marx said an interesting thing, which was her, the contact she had had with Bauhaus trained people, um, partly in Germany, but mostly in Britain, I think, was not that they were good at doing any one particular thing, but that they were very adaptable. They had transferable skills, as we now call them. Uh, and that sounds very credible to me. Any other questions? Does anyone have any information about other schools? Um, I mean, it's the, it's, it's a, it really is a key issue. What were they doing in the other Kunstakademie? I mean, there's Behrens Dusseldorf, I yes. suppose, you know, before that as well. Breslau is terribly important. But one of the defences, I suppose, against uh, Allen's uh, puncturing the balloon could be precisely that. We don't know what was going on in the other schools. We know what was going on. Or at least the Bauhaus had the brand name. No yes. one talks about Haller. Yes. Well, the point I was making about Bauhaus having become our standard of measurement, possibly in a slightly crude way, is does it look like one of their things, um, I think could obscure our ability to comparatively assess these other things. Like in Leipzig, they're doing something that's recognisably a bit different, but it's not that far away. You didn't, I mean, you've avoided, you've avoided talking about uh, the United Kingdom, um, but I think you have an argument that there is a perfectly competent modern thrust going on in this country at the same time, uh, that what is eclipsed when Gropius comes and isn't able to, isn't able to get the attention that it deserves? Uh, very far from eclipsed, I would say, it just carries on. Um, he, you know, is, is a bit of a stimulus. Uh, he, the whole position of Gropius in England is, is quite hard to evaluate. I think he's kind of overrated at the beginning and people think he's going to do something amazing and that is quite unrealistic, both in terms of him, uh, partly he's feeling rather depressed at that time anyway, and, you know, the, the institutional systems that are in place can't sort of accommodate him, we know that. 
Uh, it's not that they're hostile to him, it's just things move rather slowly and funding and issues like that are a problem. What does happen, uh, which I have written about, is the arrival of the Riemann School, which was a private school from Berlin, focused on what we might call commercial art, um, window dressing, photography, graphic design, posters, fashion. Uh, and they come to London in 1936 with quite a lot of money behind them. Uh, you know, they're in flight from the Nazis, uh, acquire a building in Westminster, fit it out, open up, get a lot of publicity, and the model that they're offering, the, the educational model, is much more appropriate because you can take short courses. Uh, Agatha Christie took a short course in photography there, for example. They have a mixture of German and English teachers, and um, uh, Leonard Rosamann taught there, Milner Gray taught there. Um, you know, people who, who were not so doctrinaire, you might say. Uh, they were keen to impart skills, keen to freshen right. things up. In shop window display, it was said that you know, very soon all the major department stores were sending their personnel there because you had to keep up. And the German method of window display was much more refined, far fewer objects, making a sort of attractive, interesting, amusing, possibly slightly surrealist display. There's one example of a display of raincoats, and they're all sort of on nylon fishing wire um, with a sort of rainy backdrop, and you know, they're all kind of floating across the window. Um, you know, stuff. Even today, that doesn't happen very much, but we may remember it from our youth. Uh, and, you know, it's not world-shattering, but it's, it's actually turning the wheels of commerce in a fresh way. So I would hold up Ryman as being actually what England needed. It didn't particularly need Bauhaus at that moment, I don't think. Uh, the sort of rudiments of it were there within the existing system. And there's this other very fascinating story about, you know, I'd love to substantiate this more, but. Uh, the Scottish painter William Johnston became head of Camberwell in about 1936. Uh, and he says in his memoirs that uh, he wanted a sort of foundation course for industrial designers. Uh, and he hired somebody called Albert Halliwell, who was a poster artist. Now, if you look at Halliwell's work, it gives you no clue, really. I mean, it's good, but uh, uh, Halliwell created what was effectively a Bauhaus war course. And Johnston says, I didn't even know about the Bauhaus forecourts at that time. I just sort of realized this is what we needed. Uh, then later at the Central School after the war, when Johnston was head, uh, he sort of expanded this and got in um, members of the independent group and a, and a very interesting team of young people. And I think he was a genius uh, as an educator. And he, was, he really hated Robin Darwin. Uh, who became head of the Royal College of Art and was terribly pleased with himself and uh, managed to build up his own reputation in such a way that it's still there. I'd say we, you know, we know quite a lot about Robin Darwin and he, uh, we are told he's so marvellous. Well, he, you know, in his weird sort of English establishment way, perhaps he was. Uh, but I think the central under Johnston was much more exciting and got there first. The, the, the question of, of you know, what what this country represented for Gropius, I think, is interesting. And you, you talk about the ambivalence about it. Um, when I, I did a BBC program about Gropius well, back in the 80s, and it was very clear then that the, the reputation was that he, I mean, he had two and a half, three years here. He built two houses and in Pinkton Village College, and, and that was it. And he couldn't get the work, and it was a disaster. Interesting entirely different perspective from Jonathan Petropoulos uh, in, um, in Santa, where, in California, uh, Santa Clara, um, who thinks that Gropius's time in, in, in the UK was a, a little triumph, that the disaster for Gropius was actually his time in Germany when he built very little. I mean, after arriving at the Bauhaus, a couple of houses, the master's houses, um, almost nothing else. The compromise for Gropius, and you said that, well, that Gropius and Mies could both be left-wing, but not too left-wing, but they didn't actually build anything. There were, a, there were a couple of projects. I mean, there were one of them did the, what, the, the mining and minerals exhibition. Yes, at the, yes. At, yeah, at the, but it didn't leave any traces behind. Yeah. Well, thank you, Stephen. I think I have to say almost everything you've said is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, That's my job. But, but where do I begin? Uh, uh, David. Uh, this is pretty more of a comment. Uh, I, I was a pupil at Impton Village College. Having failed my 11 class, aged 11, I turned up in short trousers. So I think of the Bauhaus and Grotius as being predominantly about education rather than the production of a style or an architecture or a furniture. Uh, and by the way, it was a great school to study in, particularly as an East Anglian, if you like skies that move rather slowly over a big area. So I spent a lot of time looking out of windows. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to me one of the great products of the Bauhaus came through their photography and behind of, of self-publicity, and they photographed themselves endlessly, often with clothes on and sometimes without, but they created this image of a community learning together, and my God, it looked fun. And I wonder the degree to which they created an <coughs> image, which then becomes the image of an art school, where you could go and have fun and play a guitar, and you get good. But the image that what the art school became in the UK, certainly from the 60s, of a place of liberation and freedom and eccentricity. Yes, I wish we knew. It's a, it'd be a complicated one to answer effectively. I mean, just to take one uh, case study, who does come in my book, uh, uh, an Englishman called Wilfred Franks, um, who uh, grew up in London, and he joined the Kibbo Kift Kindred uh, which you may know about through the exhibition at Whitechapel not so long ago. He was on one of their hikes, I think, and met Rolf Gardner, the father of John Elliot Gardner, uh, pioneer um, organic agriculturalist and advocate of Anglo-German friendship. Uh, and Rolf Gardner rather took a fancy to him uh, and uh, arranged for his fees to be paid to go to the Bar Hochschule at Weimar uh, in, I think, about 1928 or 29. So Wilf went out there and you know, describes this in a memoir that's published online. Uh, had quite a nice time. He obviously went to Dessau without being enrolled and hung about and had a good time there too. But he'd been this sort of von der Vogel figure uh, with green shorts and a green shirt. Um, you know, all English made uh, at the beginning. So we were not that far on a different page. He then was introduced to the composer Michael Tippett when he came back, and they went off to a work camp in Cleveland uh, and produced the Beggar's Opera um, with the out-of-work ironstone miners of Boosbeck. Uh, and the whole Boosbeck story, Michael Tippett, Wilfred Franks, Francesca Allenson, is another whole saga of the early 30s that you know, is recorded, but not all that thoroughly. Uh, and, you know, there was, there was quite a lot of that going on, I would say. Um, and particularly the English sort of reception of the van der Vogel idea. And people had heard about it and, and copied it. The idea of dressing differently, you know, if you don't have a job, just go off and sleep under the hedges and in the barns and they'll give you a bowl, bowl of soup and, you know, that would be your life. Yeah, I think you're right what you say about <clears throat> teaching methods. I, I was a student in Weimar at the Bauhaus Schule in, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And as you say, the GDR had a very ambivalent relationship to the Bauhaus tradition. But what had survived was like the foundation course. It wasn't a whole year, it was only half a year, but we had a foundation course. It was wonderful. And the teaching was, yeah, art school, more like art school than like uh, technical college. And um, yeah, it was free and open and very friendly relationship with the teachers, etc. That's fascinating. Mm. I want to know more. Will you come and speak at the conference I'm doing on the 30th of November? <laughs> Tell us more. Well, uh, uh, well, it's a sort of, well, it's, it's kind of r wrapping up the Bauhaus at the end of the year kind of thing. Uh, and I, I, this is my opportunity to announce it. The programme will be published, it'll be a 20th century society event, so you'll find the details there in a week or two. But, but that would be a, an amazing contribution to have.
Let's speak up. I think we've done very well. I, uh, I think we, we need to draw this to an end. It's, it's getting on a little bit. Philip is going to make an announcement. Um, but before he does, I want to thank Alan for his very stimulating talk and for willing to pay the questions.